Well, joining me now in Nairobi is David Owiro. He's the founder of the Africa Development Think Tank. Good to have you on the program, David. So this decision to finally go ahead with this Africa Free Trade Agreement, the vast majority of nations have signed up to it. Is this the game changer that they're making it out to be? Yes, uh, certainly it is. Um, as you know, trade is a big enabler for achieving economic development. And any efforts that governments take to bring down tariffs and non-tariff barriers actually uh, turns out to be quite positive for economic development and uh, indicators such as wealth, wealth uh, creation and even uh, employment opportunities. And so this drive by African nations to have a continental-wide free trade agreement uh, is uh, actually quite laudable. Uh, as you might know, uh, Africa, the trade within Africa, intra-African trade, is currently standing at about 18%. Mm -hmm. And given that Africa trades mostly uh, its manufactured good within itself, this might actually be you know, the panacea to solving our industrialization uh, right. dream. Right. So intra-regional trade among African countries, about 18%, as you said, whereas it's about 60% for Asia, about 70% for Europe, right? So they're not trading yes. amongst themselves and with each other. They're trading and exporting to other countries, which leads me to ask, aren't the Chinese going to go, hey, hold on, guys? Aren't the Americans going to say, well, hold on, we, we cornered this market. You can't. You can't trade with each other. You're taking our business away from us. <laughs> well, um, that's not expected because the pattern of trade is very different. Uh, as I've just stated, uh, the trade happening within Africa and amongst African nations is mostly in the value-added goods. And uh, if you compare that with uh, the kind of trade that happens between, say, China and Africa, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and US and uh, Europe mm -hmm. is mostly on uh, raw commodity exports. And so these tend to be, you know, your agricultural goods, uh, your uh, mineral resources, and so on and so forth. Right. And, uh, you know, with regards to China, actually, we, we do import a lot of finished products from China. And so uh, we actually have a, a big imbalance between Africa and China. Right. But with regards to what we, what we actually do export to China is actually quite quite minimal. One of the, and so okay, there's, right. there is no competition and right. there, there might not be any dispute. Okay. One of the criticisms of NAFTA, for example, in the Americas is that it seems to be heavily loaded towards the most powerful nation there, the United States. Are we going to see something like this being dominated by Nigeria, by South Africa, maybe even Egypt, because there are major disparities when it comes to the economies of these countries? and the rest of the continent? Certainly, that is a major risk uh, that, uh, you know, in any trading configuration, when you have large economies uh, partnering up with small economies, there's always the risk of job displacements and job moving from, you know, the more advanced economies down to the less advanced economies. Uh, and so I think the, uh, the drafters and the negotiators um, of, the, of the framework are the ones who have to put in place uh, measures so that they're able to protect the vulnerable mm -hmm. economies and the economies that are still at uh, the lower stages of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, because there still is some, some, something to be said about the benefits that such a trading framework uh, can put in place. So certainly there are usually some welfare gains, uh, I mean, welfare losses with regards to jobs and, uh, you know, uh, uh, FDI, which is foreign direct investments that are attracted to um, or that are invested in uh, the smaller economies. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, in the long run, everybody benefits uh, when, whenever there is right. such a trading arrangement. Right. And if we take two countries, for example, so say we take Botswana in the south, which is a democracy, which is stable, things are generally run in a, in a fair, relatively equal way. And we take maybe Mauritania up in the north, and we say there's, there's trade between the two. When there's uh, free trade in Botswana, are we going to see more likely benefiting Botswanan citizens? But when we see Mauritania opened up to that same sort of free trade, isn't that going to just enrich and empower the small dictatorial elite at the top of that country? Is that just a natural consequence of this? 
Um, certainly, the the pattern of trade and the what can be sort of uh, you know implied through the trade implications across the economy do to a to a large extent depend upon the domestic uh, structure of the economy. And so, um, when you have a given number of countries, and uh, you know the the expectation is that the countries which would benefit most would be the ones whose uh, trading policy, uh, trade policy, and trade frameworks. Uh, you know, work best within those environments. And so if you have, uh, in the two examples you've given, Mauritania, where you've got uh, hegemony and there isn't even, there isn't really a free economy uh, mm -hmm. as such, and it's largely dependent on, say, existing networks, whether political or family networks, uh, you know, the, the benefits of uh, free trade then will not be felt, uh, you know, equally by everyone in that economy. And so if you contrast that with a country such as Botswana, which has, perhaps a more freer uh, economy where uh, you have, uh, you know, benefits accruing, benefits of trade accruing almost across all the ranks uh, of, of, of the economy, then you, you would begin to see contrast in terms of who benefits most, uh, you know, uh, in a given free, uh, trading environment such as this one that is uh, to be put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had to look at the biggest hindrance to this getting off the ground or working smoothly across the continent, and yes, countries vary within the continent, but would that be corruption and bad governance or would it be something as simple as infrastructure that can't be relied on consistently enough? Uh, actually, from the regional economic community's uh, experience and practice that we are seeing, because as you know, the continent already has uh, uh, various regional economic configurations. So we've got the uh, East African community in East Africa, We've got the ECOWAS within West Africa, and we've got the Southern African Customs Union uh, within South Africa. And what we are seeing even within those regional communities, in spite of you know, uh, ex uh, their existing uh, you know, more advanced stages of economic integration, the challenges of cross-border trade still persist. And so the challenges we still see are things such as uh, outright bans, where you know, a small economy might just uh, put a ban on uh, products coming from uh, a larger economy to protect its citizens. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, we see, you know, uh, various uh, very uh, explicit and often intrusive customs procedures that are not uh, in harmony. And so, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, sort of raise the cost of doing business. And so, you know, and all this cascade up, upwards uh, to the, you know, putting in place uh, sort of a, an, an inconsistent uh, trading environment. And so, as investors, it becomes then very difficult to make investment decisions just because of the challenges that uh, do exist uh, in spite of, right. of, of, of uh, you know, there being regional economic communities. Right. And so for me, the, the big challenge that uh, perhaps having in place a continental-wide uh, regional economic uh, community, you know, will be really to take the lessons in terms of the challenges that we're already seeing uh, from the uh, regional economic communities and trying to apply and uh, resolve right. those challenges at the continental level. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned them because they do also roll off the tongue, right? So when we, we talk of COMESA or yeah. ECOWAS or, or SADC or whatever, and with yeah. this one, I don't even know how to say it, right? So I've been trying <laughs> not to say So it's capital A, small f, capital C, yes. f, t, a. Do, do you know how to say yes. it? Have you heard anybody <laughs> even try to say it? Because that's probably the biggest problem with this thing. It's, it's, it's a horrible acronym. How do you say it? Do you know? I, I don't know. Even me, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. Um, just big but, picture. Uh, yeah. You know, I think yeah. They, just, yeah, they need, I, I think yes. they need to Go work ahead. on that. Uh, they should hire me as a consultant and uh, come up with another uh, acronym. But just very finally, anytime we see African leaders come together and say, hey, we need to work together and we need to engage in trade and not aid and we need to do business with each other. Does that mean that things are moving in the right direction? Yes, so uh, certainly the, there's a change and a shift in the policy leadership that we have on the continent. We have an, uh, uh, an AU Agenda 2063, which espouses uh, African priorities and amongst those uh, are to not only create a continental-wide uh, movement so that we have better economic development within national countries, but also to lay the infrastructure, uh, 
uh, requirements uh, of the of the of the continent, as well as putting in place, uh, you know, modernization of the agricultural sector. And so this doesn't it, it does sort of indeed seem to be um, a better leadership, and there, there does indeed seem to be an honest push for uh, addressing the key challenges of the continent. David Owiro, good to have you on the Newsmakers. Thank you very much for joining us.